I'm Corrie Perkin and it is my pleasure to be here with our Melbourne Press Club friends, with Anne Peacock and the wonderful team at Crown, the gang at Mr Hive, uh, all of you and of course our special guest John Fane. Thank you, thank you very much. I would also like to, on all of our behalf, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay all of our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. It's a very special place, this bank of the Yarra, and um, I love coming to Crown, even though I got a bit lost today, and <laughs> I feel I need my map when I come here. But um, it's great to be here. And can um, I add, Curry, my also I pay my respects to the owners of this land that we meet on, and express my personal impatience for a treaty or treaties for the future in order to try and address just some of the mistakes we've made in our past, some of which are discussed in this, this book. I love the way he kicks off the lunch with the controversial. That is great. We will get, I think we'll get back to that, uh, John. Um, we might even talk a bit of election stuff too if nobody's bored. But the reason for us to... That, that's an ambush. The reason for us to be here today is to celebrate John's, uh, not his first book, he's written a couple of other books, but this is as mighty as the mighty Apollo. Apollo and Thelma, a true tall tale, published by Hardy Grant. Um, my memory, my first memory of this book was not actually as a bookseller, as many of you know I had a bookshop until recently, um, but as John's, uh, one of John's co-hosts on the Conversation Hour on his most popular 774 radio program. And I th it was our last show together, but it certainly wasn't your last big bash at the town hall. But, at, but the mic went off at midday, the guest disappeared, and I said to John, what are you planning to do? And um, he said, I'm, I think I might revisit this idea that has been bugging me since I was a baby solicitor. And I want to plug away at it. It's a case that came my way and I haven't been able to let go. Well, he sure hasn't because a couple of hundred pages later, an extraordinary amount of research, lots and lots of conversations with participants, lots of delving back into, I think, your own diaries and your own legal notes on this um, most interesting case. But also, for me more particularly as the reader, who uh, knows John, we all know of John if you haven't met him, he's been on our wireless for more than 23 years, and um, for me it was the discovery of who John Fane is and John Fane's story. And those of you who loved his radio program in the mornings, you'll know that he's always very good at never revealing too much about himself. And Jan would occasionally be mentioned as being a bit narky about you not putting the washing out or you of course talked quite a lot about Jack, your son, when you did your wonderful trip, when you had your leave of absence and you traveled to London together in a car. But we never, we never heard much of what John's, John was thinking about certain topics or how he felt about certain things. And there is a lot of feeling and a lot of energy and a lot of John in this book. And for that reason, just one reason, I commend it to you. The second reason I think you should all go and buy it is it's utterly beautifully written. Now, is this a surprise? <laughs> um, as a bookseller of 12 years, it is a surprise because so often we have the media identity who could probably have written a really easy book, The Tell All, or The Dumping on the ABC, or some, something like that. But in fact, he's had the courage to go deeper into a whole lot of issues, not just an interesting will that he had to resolve, but he had to go into his own personal, his family history. Um, John, as many of you know, is the child of Holocaust survivors, so there's generational trauma there, which is a huge topic. Um, indigenous rights, um, family violence, alcoholism, as it related to this family, but as, as it's come across John's path as well. So, I commend you for this book, and now let's, go, let get, let's get down you. and have a chat. Um, we will have questions too, so I'll, we'll probably chat for about 40 minutes or something. If you have a question, please pop your hand up at the end, John would love to answer it. John, let's go back to that day when you said to me after the conversation now you were going to work on this new book <laughs> or this new idea. Um, 
how, what was the, and then and then you have the big bash at the town hall, and then which, which I never wanted. Which you never wanted. That's no, but the ABC say. very much wanted because when they got rid of Red, my former colleague in the breakfast shift, <laughs> the reputational harm to the radio station was significant. And I wanted to leave even before then, and they would kept saying, no, 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 we want you to do another year, do another two years or whatever. And then they said, well, you can't leave now because if Red leaves and you leave at the same time, the whole thing falls apart, so can you stay on? And then when I said, oh, well, I'm definitely leaving now, they said, well, let's put on a big bash and we can try and repair some of the damage. And I said, yeah, okay, we'll put on a show in the foyer. And they went, nah, we're going somewhere else. And I... It was agony at the town hall for me. It was like having my teeth pulled publicly, but I had to go along with it. And it turned out to be fantastic. I mean, I loved every minute of it in the end, but it was not my, not my instinct to do something like that at all. But, it, yeah, it was huge. So, so maybe not the morning after or even the week after, but then at what point did you think, well, this is it now, this is the rest of my life, and, 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 <laughs> and then you revisited, decided to revisit the story of... of Paul Anderson? Um, when I was leaving the ABC, I set up a whole lot of things that I was going to do afterwards, and one of them was to do a Vice-Chancellor's Fellowship at the University of Melbourne, and there's some colleagues here, and it's lovely to see you all. Um, and I was also hired to do some work in Port Moresby. Uh, the Business Council of PNG said we want someone who will come up here and do some training with some of our people, some of the regional governors, some of the emerging journalists, and we have an event. We want you to interview the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea about corruption. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's hilarious, isn't can, it? Can I, can I come? <laughs> and... Uh, and I said, and you'll, you'll pay me to do that? How wonderful. And I was told nothing's off the table. And so um, just after I finished at the ABC, my father had a stroke and then a heart attack, a stroke and a heart attack, and he was declining. But I was in Port Moresby when COVID struck. In fact, it's worth telling you, the, the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea is a man called James Marape. He was born in a thatched cottage with a dirt floor. He's now the Prime Minister. So I've got 500 people in the biggest hotel in Port Moresby, all the parliamentarians, the diplomatic corps, the heads of all the big corporations, the mining companies, everyone's there. And I'm, I'm told you must ask him about corruption. And I say to him, if you do what you say you're going to do and introduce an anti-corruption commission, asset forfeiture laws, unexplained wealth laws, you'll be the only leader in Asia and the Pacific to have done that? What's driving you? What's motivating you to be such a, a pioneer? And his answer is an answer that no politician in Australia could ever give. He looked at me and he chuckled and he said, I want my children to be proud of their name. And I went up there ready to get stuck into this bloke and say, what sort of tin pot third world bullshit democracy are you pretending to run here? This is absurd. This place is riddled with all sorts of problems. The former prime minister, he owns hotels and buildings in the city and no one knows how he could have afforded them. What's going on here? And I just looked at him and thought, wow, what a great answer. Anyway, we kind of, we hit it off. And he said, oh, look, can you come back and do some other Did work Did you tell that anecdote when you were interviewing him? Did you share it with the group? No. I just looked. When was in, I was on stage and I just thought, wow. That was his answer. I want my children to be proud of their name. Can you imagine one of our political leaders saying that in answer to a question at a press conference? Why are you doing this? Wow. Anyway, I'd just run some training sessions and then Greg Hunt announced that the borders were closing and you were going to have to quarantine when you came back. And I came back to Melbourne. In fact, I'll tell a story about Greg Hunt too while we're on the tour. I'm in Port Moresby and I'm told you have to come back to Melbourne. My flight goes to Cairns, to Brisbane, to Melbourne. So I go on the website and I'm trying to find out, do I quarantine in Cairns or do I go through to destination? And nowhere, nowhere does it explain. Now, the joy of being in the job I used to be in was that you have people's numbers, so I sent Greg Hunt a text message. And he rang me back. And I said, I'm in Port Moresby. I can't find out. Am I supposed to quarantine in Kens or in Melbourne? He said, you're quite right to point it out. I'll get that fixed. No, you quarantine at destination. To which I said, really? 
I fly from Port Moresby to Cairns, arrive in international arrivals, go through quarantine, go through customs, go through passports, collect my bags, transfer from the international arrivals to domestic departures, sit in the cafe, buy the newspaper, get a cup of tea, get on a plane, fly to Brisbane, change planes, fly to Melbourne, pick up my bags, get in a taxi, drive home, and then I quarantine. This is crazy. Yes, you're quite right, John. I think we'll have to look at this. <laughs> and I thought, what sort of shit show is this? They're making it up as they go, and they were. I mean, it's not, I'm, it's not a criticism of a political party. It's just that's how unprepared we were. The point of this anecdote is I came home, went into quarantine, and then every day for the next three weeks, things were cancelled on me. Every single time the phone rang, it was someone saying, I'm really sorry, but... So after a few weeks, I felt sorry for myself, retreated into the shed, started playing with old cars, trying not to hurt myself or break anything, and then looked at my diary, and for the rest of my life, I didn't have a single appointment. Now, for some people, that would be sheer joy, but for someone who's been at the, the thick of things for so long, it was an existential crisis. And I had to stare at myself in the mirror and go, well, if you don't have things to do, who are you? And what are you going to do with the rest of your working life? Now, Apollo and Thelma had always been like that dinner table story that you tell that irritates your friends and your wife says, oh, God, if you do that once more, I'm walking out. And I'd sort of thought, well, it's gone from the side of my desk to the floor to the bookshelf to the top corner to the back of the cupboard, I'll bring it out. And I had a whole lot of cassettes I'd recorded interviews with people back in the 1990s and I had the file from the law firm from the 1980s from the estate of Thelma Cecilia Hawkes and I thought, well, I've always said I'm going to tell this story. If I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it and I have to stop pretending. And besides, what else have I got to do? So the book starts with, I only met Thelma Hawkes after she died. Her brother, the mighty Apollo, introduced us. And to tell you their story, I have to tell you some of mine. So I was a baby lawyer. I was at a law firm called Barker, Harty & Co, who come in for a bit of gentle mocking in the book. And uh, my boss, who was, for instance, one of the main lawyers for Christopher Scase, amongst other people, and I got to do Pixie and Christopher's kitchen renovation dispute with the builders, which was hilarious. The exhaust fans for the internal barbecue weren't strong enough, so they didn't pay hundreds of thousands of dollars. So good on you, Pixie. Anyway, all that sort of stuff was not quite as much fun as getting to know the mighty Apollo. So he came in, his sister, Thelma, had suddenly died. She ran on her own for 20 years, the most remote pub you can imagine in Australia. It's at a place called Top Springs which is the intersection of two red dirt roads two and a half hours west of Catherine towards the West Australian border. And when she died, there's a great story about the cop and the dog and the frog, which I don't think we've got time to tell today. Not just yet, no. no? Leave, leave something for the book. Yeah, yeah. And there was so much skullduggery surrounding this, but my client, the mighty Apollo, Paul Alexander McPherson Anderson, was the litigation guardian for his three underage sons. They were the beneficiaries. They suddenly owned a pub in the Northern Territory. And they were all teenagers. So we had to work out what to do with it, how to prepare it for sale, how to keep it running in the meantime, and we had to work out the disputes. So the, the barman, who we thought was an employee, claimed to actually be a partner in the business and said he owned half of it. And on and on it went. The builders hadn't been paid, even though the pub was built 15 years before. The architects hadn't been paid. Suppliers, bills, the tax office, the pension people. She was on a pension, even though she wasn't old enough. And she was working full-time, running a profitable business. On and on. The skullduggery was fantastic. It was magnificent. So we're trying to work this out. And the public trustee of the Northern Territory is in charge of this estate for reasons that the book explains to do with a crooked solicitor who'd been struck off. And lo and behold, the public trustee, a man called John Flynn, affectionately now known as Flynn of the Outback, of course, says, look, John, we can talk about this till the cows come home over the phone, but you can't really get a handle on this unless you come up to the Territory and we go and meet with Norm Douglas, the claimant, the barman, meet his lawyers, meet with the tax office, meet with the accountants, and then you have to come down and visit Top Springs. 
you've got to come down and check out the pub so that you know what this asset is and how unique it is I, and I what love, it's worth. I love your, uh, the conversation you had with the senior partner at the time who, of course, like all good senior partners in law firms, is watching the bank balance and says, oh, I think you can do this over the phone. And you're completely convinced that you cannot. No. And, I, and, and, and what you find there is an, a mass, is an amazing journey. Well, and he is persuaded on the undertaking that my hourly rate in six-minute units will be covered by the public trustee of the Northern Territory, whether I'm in the office in Melbourne or flying to Darwin. And for the whole time I'm away, he says, fine, what do we care? Off you go. Have a great time. And I think I quip in the book, if, if I had a pith helmet, I would have taken it with me. I knew nothing about the Territory. And I arrive in Darwin, I get off the plane at the airport, and there I am in my polyester shirt, sweating out through the, the humidity. And John Flynn looks at me and he probably thinks, oh God, they've sent the mail boy, what's going on here? You know, I'm, what am I, 25 or something? And he says, oh, welcome to Darwin. Have you been to Darwin before, John? And I say, no. Have you been to the Territory before, John? No. Have you been round the outback at all? No. <sighs> Well, there's not much point going straight down to Top Springs because you won't have a point of reference for the pub, so we, might, we just might stop off at a few along the way. And I'm still very good friends with John Flynn. He's a remarkable man and uh, it's a remarkable story, but this is my introduction to the estate of Thelma Cecilia Hawkes. And it goes on for years and years and years. And everyone you meet, the I mean, people have been to the Territory. Everyone's a character. Everyone's got a story. Most of them are running away from something. And if you can just scratch away far enough, you find the most incredibly rich vein of anecdotes and experiences. It's just an amazing place. I want to, uh, I want to talk about Paul Anderson. Uh, the mighty Apollo. So looking around the room, no one here is old enough probably to remember him on television. Oh, I think you might be <laughs> Because wrong. television was kind of his last medium, I guess. But he, he was a strong man in the old-fashioned carnival kind of way. And uh, he's, he, he, toward the end of his life, as John said, he owned gymnasiums. But he was one of those characters who if it had existed in the 30s and 40s, he would have been on it every week, the Penthouse Club. Or um, we had Princess Panda as our go-to as a child. We probably would have had the mighty Apollo had he been born in, at a later time with television. But he used to do remarkable feats of strength, including, and there, there would always be the press photographers, and he was always appearing everywhere, the mighty Apollo in Swanson Street, pulling a tram along with his teeth. Um, all sorts of wacky things like that. A larger-than-life character, but a very interesting background that you go into, John, and I wonder if you can just give us a little glimpse of the really tough working-class life that he and Thelma shared as children in Melbourne. And one goes to the Northern Territory to seek fortune, and the other one is in Melbourne to seek fame, and the, and the divergence of the brother and sister. Who, who have other siblings, but these two stay close and basically lose contact with the rest of the extended family. Um, so Thelma, after World War, Thelma and, and Apollo are doing what's called adagio dancing at the Tivoli and elsewhere as part of their routines of getting into showbiz to break out of the poverty of the mean streets of Collingwood. And then during the war, Thelma meets the man who became her husband, Sid Hawkes, with whom I sat down and had a very long interview on cassette in the mid-1990s. Now, Sid's a chapter in my book, but he could be a book entirely on his own. And extraordinary things. I mean, you know, he, he, he pioneered road trains in the Northern Territory to move cattle around because there were no trains. Um, he tells an incredible story about the load shifted crossing a creek one time and he climbed up on top of these massively overloaded trucks to tighten the ropes and he got his foot caught, fell, hit his head, unconscious. A day and a half later, a passing Aboriginal couple find him, revive him, and stop the meat ants from eating through his nose into his brain, which would have killed him if he hadn't been found sometime within that half hour or so. Uh, you know, I've never been able to look at an ant's nest in the territory, you know, those big tall things, never been able to look at one in quite the same way since. I mean, he's just one of these people, you start talking to him and he just tells story after story after story. 
long after he split up with Thelma and they fell apart over money, as so often happens. Um, he uses this phrase, oh, we had, I knew when he found she was stealing money from the business and so socking it away in secret bank accounts, he said, oh, I knew we were going to have to split the blanket. Isn't that a great phrase? Split the blanket? Isn't that better than going to the family court? Yeah, anyway. So Sid's one of these larger-than-life characters. Um, he tells a story about he's, he's hired by Gerald Stone to take 60 minutes and carry Packer across to Timor at the height of the Indonesian invasion because he's a notorious smuggler between Timor and Australia and he knows the way to get across without navigating and without radio or radar because of the war. And on and on it goes. I mean, he's just an incredible character. So Sid and Thelma go up and they, they go to set up a store which becomes a pub at a point where they're told there'll be a railway spur line for cattle to be taken to the markets down south because someone tipped them off in 1949 at the end of the war that there was going to be a railway line from Alice Springs to Darwin. Well, 1949, they had a long time to wait, didn't they? And it's finally been made, but there's never a spur line out because technology's taken over and the road trains are much more flexible than railways. So they set up this tiny little store that becomes a pub and then they split the blanket. He leaves, he takes the trucks, she keeps the pub and she runs it on her own. She's this redneck rogue ruffian and with a pistol in her pocket. Pub's name would be? And the pub is called the Wander Inn. And the joke by the stockman is, yeah, you wander in, but you stagger out. <laughs> and she's notorious. If you, if you come past and, the, you know, the, the drovers would come by on horseback, but she would charge them for a drum of petrol, even if they arrived on horseback. And if the kids came from one of the nearby stations, she'd offer them a lolly and then put a carton of lollies on the bill for the, for the local station. Stuff would go missing on transporters and turn up in her store, even though she had no idea how it got there, and on and on it goes. And there's stories about Thelma Hawke's our legion, her, her nickname. Shall I do this? Yeah, if anyone's particularly sensitive, you can just tune out for a moment. Her nickname was Old Leather Tits. And she was renowned throughout the territory for, you know, her, her sartorial elegance, not, but also her, her personal style in running the joint. So she dies suddenly. Apollo comes into the law firm saying, we need a lawyer. I get sent off up there. And I become reasonably, I become friendly with Apollo. He's my favourite client. Compared to all the other people, you know, the leases for helicopters in Bass Strait oil wells and the building disputes and all the other dull shit that's part and parcel of being a baby commercial lawyer, he is fascinating. And I go to visit him in the gym. There's all these pictures around the wall, all these trophies and extraordinary memorabilia, and I look at them and go... How does someone survive having an elephant stand on them? I mean, it's got, what's the trick? What's the stunt? And indignantly, he says, there is no stunt, John. Don't insult me by calling these stunts. They're genuine feats of strength. And I just look at this bloke. He's five foot four. And there's something extraordinary about him. He's enigmatic, he's charismatic, and he says he has cosmic powers. Now, I don't know to this day whether maybe he did have cosmic powers, but he could pull a tram with a cable attached to a toggle in his mouth. And if that wasn't hard enough, he'd say, everybody get on the tram and I'll do it again, fully laden. He would get the biggest fire engine at the Eastern Hill Fire Station and pull it up the slope at Eastern Hill with his teeth. And if that wasn't enough, he'd get what he called bathing beauties very politically incorrect, but at the time it was entirely normal, and do it for Picks, Picks People, it was called, wasn't it, or Australia Post. And he, he just did these things, and to this day no one can explain how he could do them. He, he would have cars drive over him while he lay on a bed of nails. He had the world record for having cars driving over him, and he was an extraordinary man. So I, I became enamoured with the mighty Apollo, and through a circuitous route to do with Frank Hardy, the famous Australian author of Power Without Glory, I end up becoming more and more interested in Apollo, Thelma's Pub and the Gurindji Walk-Off, which I get introduced to through Frank Hardy. Now, people may know about Power Without Glory, and if you haven't read it, I can't recommend it enough. And then he also wrote, after he wrote Power Without Glory, he was prosecuted 
for criminal defamation. So if a press club audience, if someone produces something defamatory, you sue for damages. Very, very occasionally, someone will be sued and prosecuted for criminal defamation. Now, with Hardy, he was a bankrupt communist activist. There was no point suing him for damages. He didn't have a penny. But if you went against him for criminal defamation, if you could get the police to lay a charge, and the Wrens were very powerful and could, then you not only put him in jail, but you can also suppress the book. They tried and they failed. So I'm interviewing Sir John Stark for an oral history series for the ABC about old lawyers. And he tells the story of representing Hardy in the Power That Glory trial. And Hardy, when I put it to air, Hardy hears it and gets in touch and says, I want to hear all the other things that Stark said about my case that you didn't put on the program. So I find myself sitting in the ABC studios in the old broadcast house in Lonsdale Street, knee to knee with one of my literary heroes, lacing up a reel-to-reel -reel tape in one of the little booths where Andrew Dodd used to sit there and cut tape. And I'm sitting there playing the interview with Sir John Stark to Frank Hardy, who then says to me, would Stark talk to me? I've got so many questions for him. Stark's, at, he's retired and bored and lonely down at Mount Eliza and says, sure, I don't care, bring people down, I love visitors. And Stark's one of the most garrulous people I've ever met. But when I take Hardy down to meet him, Stark hardly gets a word in. Hardy's, yep, 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 it's amazing. And I taped that too, I've got that tape somewhere. And they have this extraordinary time talking about Hardy's trial. And we're trying to work out, Hardy says, you can be useful to me, mate. You can help me work out why I ever got prosecuted. Who gave the order that I be charged with criminal defamation? But before we can track down through the layers of hierarchy, Hardy suddenly dies. I wake up one morning, it's on the news, Frank Hardy, the famous Australian author, is dead. And I'm really upset. I've become very fond of him. And I take flowers around to his house for Jenny Barrington, his partner. His kids are all there. And two days later, I find myself being asked to host his memorial service at Collingwood Town Hall, and we broadcast it to the nation. I'm on stage as the MC and the host of the broadcast and the memorial service, and Gough Whitlam delivers one of the eulogies and tells Australia, it's Hardy who opened my eyes to the need for land rights. It's Hardy through his work with the Gurindji at Wave Hill who told us about Indigenous disadvantage. And then when he finishes to a standing ovation, I go to help him down the stairs and he cries on my shoulder with emotion. I didn't dry clean that suit ever again. But there's Whitlam going down the stairs and I have one of those genuine lightning bolt moments. Thelma's pub, the Gurindji walk off. Thelma's pub at Wave Hill it, at Top Springs is the nearest pub to Wave Hill. Hardy and Thelma must have crossed paths. The communist, rabble-rousing, shit-stirring activist and the redneck, racist, solo publican. Wouldn't that have been incredible? So I reread The Unlucky Australians, searching for this snippet that links Hardy and Thelma Hawkes. And it's not there. It's barely mentioned Top Springs. It's mentioned to somewhere you stopped off for petrol. And then over my disappointment comes the realisation. That tells me just as much as if they had run into each other. No one associated with the Gurindji would have anything to do with Thelma Hawks and Top Springs if they could possibly avoid it. She was so out there, they wouldn't go to the pub. They weren't welcome. And so a piece in the jigsaw puzzle falls into place. And I just keep searching. And the more I talk to people about what was going on back in that time, the more I begin to realise that the, you know, from little things, big things grow, the Kev Carmody and Paul Kelly song all together, from little things, big... No, OK. So that's about the Wave Hill walk-off, along with that iconic photo of Gough Whitlam pouring dirt into Vincent Lingiari's hand. And when I start rereading the documents and going back to source, 
as any decent journalist or lawyer should always do, I find there's, there's been an airbrushing of history. The Gurindji walk-off, we're told, was about dignity, land and wages. And when you read their petition to the Governor-General, there's one more thing, and it's been pushed aside. The Gurindji say we do this for our dignity and for our land, for our wages, and then they also go on to say, and to protect our women. And nowhere in the history books is this included. No high school teacher was going to stand up in front of your class and talk about colonial era rape. But every massacre I looked into, every time I had a closer look, it was always the same. Dingo trappers, buffalo hunters, mineral explorers, pastoralists, white men would help themselves to Aboriginal wives and daughters. There would be a payback from the Aboriginal men and then there would be a massacre of the Aboriginal men for the payback. Over and over and over again. Now, if we do believe in truth-telling and if we do believe in treaty and if we do believe in knowing our own history, we can't keep airbrushing this out. We just can't. But that's what we've done. It was in the too hard basket and we just pretended we didn't see it. Now, if I had a reputation, Corey, for anything as a broadcaster, it was for being fearless and being prepared to ask what Tony Abbott once called the mongrel question when he introduced me to Margie at the cricket one year at the Boxing Day test. This is John Fane. He's an equal opportunity mongrel, Margie. He asks everyone horrible questions and I thought that was a pretty good job description for me. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm wanting to tell the story of Apollo and Thelma, but now I've learned all this stuff, do I leave it out? No. No, I'm not going to. I have to explain why it's relevant and how it's connected, but I'll add my voice to those other voices, far too often only Indigenous voices, but white people have a role to play here in saying, you know what, we did terrible things. We did terrible things. Why do we pretend that it never happened? Canada's been through this, New Zealand's been through this. What's wrong with us? And there's also, there's also a, a, a personal connection yes. here. Um, John's son, his eldest son, Nigel, is indigenous. And you don't often reveal that. You start to think Have of now. But I don't think so, actually in all the years on radio you ever did. No, no, because I was asked not to. Yeah. And the reason is because we're a fairly private family and Nigel was growing up and he, you know, th I mean, there's stories... But, but what happens now, what happens now, Dad's writing a book and he wants to address this issue, how... How, how does he do it? What's the change of mood in your family about suddenly you can go public with this? He says to Jan, here's the stuff I've learned about Wave Hill and the Gurindji walk off, and it connects directly to the everyday racism that Aboriginal Australians experience, that we've experienced, that we have seen with our own eyes, that Nigel has had to live through, and I could be here till midnight telling you stories. I mean, the easiest one I'll tell you is, we were in Queensland on holidays with Nigel's cousin, Joanne and Patrick. Joanne is an internationally famous artist. She's had exhibitions in New York and Paris. We're out for lunch. We're driving through Caloundra, we're looking for a table. There's no parking. I say to Joe and Pat, you go grab a table, I'll park the car, we'll come back. Jan and I go and park the car, we come back. Joe and Pat are outside the restaurant, standing there waiting, and we go, what's wrong? And they said, there's no tables. And I look through the doors, there's heaps of tables. Maybe there's a function, who knows? So I go in and say, have you got a table for four? Yes, certainly, Sue, would you like that one in the window? I say, yes, thank you, that'd be nice. I'll just go and get my family. And I go out, get Joe and Pat and Jan, we come back in and they just go, ah. Oh. Now, that's my own personal experience and I could tell you 50 stories like that over and over again. I could tell you stories about what happened when the maternal infant nurse arrived when Nigel's daughter was born and she said, this makes me cry. I have our firstborn grandchild and the welfare nurse comes around, visits them at home, 
and says to Nigel, oh, I've left my diary in the car, could you go and get my diary for me? Here are the keys. Nigel ducks out and while he's out, the nurse says to Rachel, are you safe? Are you okay? And Rachel, who's a school teacher, looks at her and goes, yeah, why? She says, oh, I'm just checking, I'm just checking. Rachel's completely shell-shocked. Nigel comes back, can't work out, the mood's changed, what's gone on here? Finds out about it later, tells us, I, am, I have steam coming out of my ears. But I think, hang on, I better check. We're in Darwin at the time. There's a colleague at the ABC, Adam Steer, had a baby the same week as Rachel had Rose. I ring up Adam and say, how are you doing? Yeah, good. How's your baby? Great. Lovely. Did you have the infant welfare nurse come around? Yeah, she did. Did she ask your wife if she was okay, if she was safe while you were out of the room? No. Why would they do that? Yeah, why would they? I have no idea. But apparently if your husband's Aboriginal, you must be at risk of family violence. Just automatically. And oh, you just, you accumulate these experiences and you don't think, none of them are enough to make the top of your head explode, but over time, you just think, what's going on? What's going on? Now, this is a much bitten tongue over all my time on the radio. I never talked about these things. I was asked not to, and I accepted that was important. But I'm not constrained anymore. But in, in um, white bread sandwich post-war Australia, were you not subjected to any forms of subtle or otherwise of anti-Semitism because of your background? Absolutely, and it makes me acutely aware of it. And in fact, in the book I say, Jews don't have a monopoly on trauma and, post, and intergenerational trauma either. And in fact, it makes me aware when we went to Kassok, um, sorry, Cossack, near Roburn in Western Australia, um, a younger son Jack was working in Roburn, which is you know, a, a very troubled community in the, in the Pilbara. And we went to Cossack, the old prison there is turned into a museum. And there are pictures in there of Aboriginal men in neck chains being led down in work gangs. And you go, yeah, I've seen pictures of that before. And then you look at the date. This is the 1920s and the 1930s. It's not the 1850s. Up to the 1930s. When was the last recognised massacre in Australia? It wasn't in the 1800s. It was in the 1900s, after World War I. And it wasn't a sudden rush of of excitement by a few people running amok. No. The massacre, the Coniston massacre as it's called, took a month, a month of hunting down Aboriginal communities, men, women and children, and killing them. Over one month. Not a day, not an hour. When do we come to terms with this stuff? Now, my Jewish community, we are absolutely right to remind people of the Holocaust and the horrors of World War II and we're seeing the appalling things going on now in Ukraine and we see the terrible things that happened in Cambodia and we see what horrible things happened in the former Yugoslavia and in Myanmar. But we have some reckoning to do too. When I was at school, we were taught, everyone in this room will know this phrase if you went to school in Australia, the, the best thing we could do was to smooth the pillow of a dying race. Are you familiar with that phrase? We were taught that the Aborigines were inevitably going to become extinct and the best thing you could do was to smooth the pillow of a dying race. I spent a week trying to find out where that phrase came from and I couldn't track it, its origin down. We were told that it was inevitable that they were an inferior people and it was inevitable that they would just eventually assimilate or die out. And that still infects our thinking to this day. While you're on this, um, this, this journey after your ABC life um, and you're delving into all of this sort of stuff and your own responses to it, which was probably confronting at times as well, you lose your father and then your mother. Um, um, yeah, they died. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I hate... I mean, I, I just... As I said, you lose. I just thought I really hate that phrase. It's all right. Both your parents died. Uh, both in a, in both a my parents space. died a year ago. So, how, how, do you, how do you rebuild your working life and your focus um, 
we were just talking about that before, how distracted you can be when you go through a trauma or a tragedy and you have a book deadline, John Fain. <laughs> yes, well, how, I... How, how hard was it all? I submitted a manuscript to Hardy Grant and they went, look, the first half's great and then it all goes to shit. What happened? I go, oh, my father died. And they say, well, that's not going to wash by the time it's published. You've got to have another go. So draft two, gave it to them, and they say, now it goes up to two-thirds, and then it falls apart. What happened there? I saw that's when my mother died, and they go, oh, come on. <laughs> this is like the dog ate my homework, but it's true, and it, it's terrible. It's terrible, and, you know, my father died, and then we had to look after my mother. We didn't grieve, and then my mother died, and I had to finish the book, so I didn't grieve, and I probably still haven't, but everyone in this room has an experience of grief, and it hits you in different ways, and I guess I've dealt with it by trying to keep really busy and pushing it off and pushing it off. Um, it might hit me at some point, it probably will. But one, one of the things that I love about John's book is, um, I, I do love a biography, I love a memoir, it's probably my favourite um, form of, uh, of, of book, of journalism. And um, there's, a, there's a newish trend in, in publishing where people are no longer just telling um, a chronological order of events. I was born here, died here. And there tends to be a lot of uh, self-reflection and circles of life coming in, people um, looking back at a, at a, at a repeating pattern um, or viewing something that happened to them when they were younger and seeing it through adult or current eyes. A great uh, example of this was the recent Miriam Margulies um, memoir. I don't know if anybody's read it this yep, much as true. It. It's absolutely fantastic. Well, she, she's extraordinary. <laughs> she's, it's, but she writes like a dream and it's a really beautiful book. She keeps revisiting things from her past. And you do as well. And I, I don't uh, think I should be mentioned in the same breath as Miriam Margulies. Oh, uh, come on. Don't be like that. No, no. no, it's, no it's, I, I it's a great you, book. I, I recommend it. Yeah. I think you can. But, but this, th these, these circles in your life keep repeating. And one of them also is, um, I was reading again the other day, uh, your passages when you talk about meeting Apollo's sons, who, as you say, are teenagers when this case begins. And then, of course, they're grown men to whom John is talking about this book and this idea and this story. And um, you've watched them grow through. And they've had li uh, lives of hardship. And in a way, I kept thinking that you were counting your blessings with your children and your parents um, as you're talking about um, their mother who ran away from the mighty Apollo and they were abandoned yep. and sent into foster care. Yep. And the, the, there are so many different strands, and you're right, this is a bit of a genre bender, this book. It doesn't fit into any easy category, and that's how I wrote it. And I kind of, the publishers went, well, can you work out, is it a story of this or this or the other? And I said, well, it's all of those things and more, and that's just how it is. So, and, and they do all connect. Everything connects. Um, Apollo's three sons, who were teenagers when I first met them, when they came into the law firm, were put into state care when they were five, seven and nine years old. Their mother, Rhonda, who started out as one of the, you know, the beauties who would be part of Apollo's act, she runs away with one of the martial arts instructors from the gym. She drops the boys at school one day and says, look after each other and be good to your father and never comes back, vanishes. The police take the boys home. Apollo has a nervous breakdown. They're put into state care. They, two of them, one of them has a, a relationship still with his mother in later life. The other two hate her. They hate her. Her name is Rhonda. One of them won't say her name. She is the incubator. She was no mother to me. The other one, Bruce, the youngest when I interview him, he says, Rhonda, the bitch, she ruined my life. I hope she rots in hell. And I say, yeah, okay, I'm sorry to hear about all of that, Bruce, but what do you want me to put in the book? Rhonda, the bitch, she ruined my life. I hope she rots in hell. Do you want me to say it once more? Rhonda, the, and on it goes. Can, can now, I just interrupt there? Can I read you Bruce's review I'll, I'll get of your there book? in a sec. Oh, yeah. So I spend a lot of time with these three now men getting their stories and getting them straight, getting their cooperation and getting them involved in the telling of the story of their father and their aunt. And they're pretty pissed off with what's in front of you now in the book. And they say, um, in fact, br br this is what Bruce says. Y you can read this in a minute. I don't think I, you're going to like this. I know I'm not. I know what he says. 
he says, we gave you the tools, we gave you the plans, we gave you the materials, all you had to do was build the house. He's a carpenter. And I said, Bruce, I did build a house. You're pissed off because there's a drawer in the kitchen that's sticking. So they, um, they were shown all the chapters about themselves and most of the chapters about their father and very few of the chapters about their aunt. And this is their reaction. You didn't show them the whole finished book? I didn't show them the whole book or we still, it still wouldn't be so thank published. You, thank you, Megan, one of our gang who's here today. For, to, uh, she alerted me to this because our book clubs are doing this as our next book, John. Oh. We might get the band back together and have another gig. Um, so this is by Bruce Anderson and he posted it, as you all can, on Amazon. You're all free to do that. As one of Apollo's three sons, I can say with the utmost sincerity that the contents of this book are largely purely fictional and an absolute load of tripe. Sadly for Apollo and Thelma's remaining family, Fane conveniently and frequently chooses fictional narrative over actual fact, for the very slanted picture he attempts to paint for the sake of an interesting tale, very thinly disguised as an accurate account according to him. Despite his claim the author was never Apollo's friend or that of his family, he was a solely a one-off business relationship. He was engaged to settle an estate, nothing more, no more than a plumber called to fix a blocked toilet. So in the several hours of conversations, two days before the, the launch that his older brother was supposed to launch the book at, in the hours of conversations, when I've tried to distill down what their concerns are, they boil down to this. I've written there were about 50 people at the funeral, at Apollo's funeral. There were 100. I said that he had in his, um, in his gym, by the time he was old and frail, he was surrounded by cobwebbed memorabilia and tarnished trophies. And they say, they were never tarnished, he always polished them. Complaint number two. Complaint number three, I've described their aunt as a racist and redneck outback publican. That's not fair. I said, hang on, it's not my description. I never met her. You can have a go at me over how I've described your father who I worked with for seven years on the estate, but I never met Thelma. Anything about Thelma is based on people who did know her, who worked with her, who lived with her, who ran the business with her, and so on. So I'm quoting other people. Don't have a go at me over what other people say about your, about your aunt. So they have this idealised view of their father. He's a superman. He's a, you know, he's a, a, a creature in their memory of extraordinary power and presence. And I've described him as vain. He was. You had to be. In fact, one of his favourite sayings is, to be great is to be misunderstood. And he took enormous pride in how he looked, how he appeared, and his persona. The, the boys say so, the boys, the men, they were boys when I, back in the day, they say so themselves and they're quoted at length in quotes they don't and can't dispute, they're on tape. But they're pissed off because they wanted a book that put their father on a pedestal and sanctified their aunt, and that's not this book. So I'm sorry, I'm deeply sorry that they're not happy. I wanted something that they would be proud of, and I think they should be because I think their father comes out as a complex and nuanced character rather than the two-dimensional superhero that they wanted. But it upsets me a great deal that that's been their reaction. But I can't do anything about it. No you, know. no, you can't. And, no. And, and as you know, a book was written about my dad years ago by Ben Hills, and there's lots, of, lots in that biography that our family abhor. But it's kind of the freedom of speech. And um, they're entitled to give you their opinion. It wouldn't surprise me, John, if the, the warmth with which this book, Apollo and Thelma, has been greeted and the amount of publicity and the discussion that you're having, it wouldn't surprise me if there's a, if there's a softening of you out there. If I could sit down with them, I would say to them, the eldest son, Paul, inherited the gym and threw away all of Apollo's memorabilia into a skip. I found it at Bendigo Swap Meet years later for sale and got it back, got him in touch with the seller, told him not to sell any of it, and got Paul, 
in touch with him and he managed to buy it all back. And he said, and it's in the book, I was so upset at the time, I was, I was doing crazy things, I'm so glad I got it back. I think the book's the same. They've read the book, they've seen it's not sanctifying their father and their aunt, they're upset, they're throwing it out. And in time, they'll want to get it back. That's okay. what I hope. Just can I say just quietly, what are the odds of you being at the Bendigo Trash and Treasure <laughs> on that particular day? Well, um, I, I go to the swap meet every year. Of course, anyone here who's got petrol running through their veins will understand that. But um, I couldn't believe that I found all this Apollo stuff. And the guy who had it said, look, it's clattering up my garage. I want to get rid of it. And I went, well, the kids are going to want it. And if they don't, I'll buy it. So I put them back in touch and they got it all back. The, so, be the bed of nails. I mean, all this stuff. It was so, just, so the trick the trick now is to not reveal what happened to the great Apollo and his sons and the will and whether they're successful or not. You have to buy the book. Um, and we have our lovely friends from Mary Martin who have come along today to sell the beautiful book. John is here to sign. Remember, it's Mother's Day in a couple of weeks. That's just a bit of a hint. You could buy a couple of um, books to give away. But before we end today, do we have any questions? I'd love to hear from you, and so would John. Any questions? And no, he, he, we had one the other night, John. He did leave the ABC of his own accord. He wasn't pushed and he wasn't shoved. Is that true, Matilda? Yes, they are. Matilda here was one of my producers when I left the ABC, and she's on the board of the Press Club now. Do we have any questions? Oh, come on. Somebody must have one. Yay! Yes. There's a microphone just there. OK, Sunday Age, the Premier who said, um, you know, you've got to do it for the Bogans. Now, in our family, we've discussed who that Premier might be. Who did now, you think it was? Brumby. No, it couldn't have been Kenneth. <laughs> you might be right. <laughs> yeah, I thought that's the you did. Yes. For people who don't know, um, last Sunday in The Age, I wrote a piece about why I'll never go to the Grand Prix, which is to do with um, the death of a marshal in a terrible freak accident years ago. The death of the marshal was bad, um, but the Grand Prix, the way they managed it at the time, just left me cold. You can go back and read the article, I won't go through it all now, but it left me cold and thinking, oh my God, you people put money ahead of everything, including the death of one of your own volunteers. Uh, I don't want anything to do with you. And yes, the, the reason why they ran the Grand Prix, according to one ex-premier, was you've got to do something for the Bogans. You can't have just all arts festivals and writers' festivals and comedy festivals and national gallery. You've got to do something for the Bogans. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. That's one way to see it. I'd never thought of it like that. So one of the great joys of being free now of the ABC is that I can tell these sorts of stories. In the past, I was never allowed to. So what's the next writing project? Is there another one? Um, no, I want to have a break. But um, I have been asked to do a few things. And um, I, I've got to chew it over and let it Oh, go settle, on. Give, give us a hint. It's just, you, it's just 60 of your closest friends here. We're not going to say anything. <laughs> no, I won't. I won't, because then I might feel I have to actually are do we it. Going to see, are um, we going to see a bit more of you during the election campaign? Yeah, I'm doing a podcast. So through the university, there's University of Sydney, La Trobe and Melbourne Uni. Uh, the Conversation, the website, The Conversation, where academics publish their material for the public. And they've commissioned us to do twice a week podcasts with Professor Andrea Carson and Annika Gallia from Sydney Uni and Simon Jackman, who's just left the US Studies Centre. And so we do that twice a week on just, you know, so there's Professor of Data, uh, Professor of Press, Professor of Polls, Professor of Parties, th the three professors, and I just kind of prod them a bit. I was on the cadet interview panel when Andrea Carson came into the room. Oh, I'm so glad we gave her the yep. job that day. Yep. Um, She's pretty Any special. other questions, anybody? Yes, Megan. Microphone's coming. John, with your experience with the Indigenous issues, I'm wondering how, how do you feel now? Do you think that we're in a place we are, where we really are going to do this properly? Or are we still failing in terms of coming to terms with what actually happened in the past and like you talk about the rapes and all of that stuff? Progress is neither inevitable nor linear. It doesn't go in a straight line. It jumps around. We all thought, I remember sitting with Jan 
when the Berlin Wall came down. And both of us sitting there looking out over the ocean, weeping, saying, thank God that's over. We'll never live with that again. From here on, anything's possible. We didn't quite imagine Vladimir Putin or Donald Trump or any of the other horrible things that have happened. And sometimes you, I mean, you know, I don't think the people of Mariupol think that progress is inevitable anymore. And it's up to us to decide where and how and at what rate we progress. And I think we are at a point where, I mean, the more people I talk to, the more overwhelmed I am by the response. It might be the people I'm talking to. I mean, I haven't gone out to um, Western Queensland. Uh, but the more people I talk to, the more I detect there is a groundswell of people saying, come on, we've got to get on with this. We just can't keep putting it in the too hard basket. Um, this election is crucial on a whole lot of things. Obviously on climate, and in, on integrity, on employment issues, industrial relations are suddenly now popping up as of today. It's also crucial on indigenous relationships. And we'll see. We'll see where we go as a country, um, what the people want to do. Uh, along with almost everybody else, I got the last election wrong in predicting the outcome, but then I never anticipated Clive Palmer. $80 million spending double everybody else combined. Whoa, no one understood what, what that. What are your thoughts about this one week too? Well, last time, the reason I think the result happened last time was Clive Palmer, the Adani convoy, I mean, how stupid. Can the Greens be that stupid again? I don't know that they can. Going and telling other people how to live their lives? I mean, for goodness sake. I mean, do whatever you like, but don't tell other people how to live their lives. And the other issue, and this was crucial, I think, was whichever staff member it was on Bill Shorten's team who thought it was a good idea to have pictures of him jogging in the media. Knock-kneed, man-boobed, red in the face, flat-footed, gasping. Does he look like a okay, Prime so Minister? Okay. Julie Bishop, yes. Oh. Julie Bishop jogging, on, knock yourself out. Um, what now, about, what this, about this time year? round? Okay, so here's the starting point. The Morrison government is effectively a minority government. There's a redistribution, gives a notional two extra seats to Labor. Young people laugh at Scott Morrison. A majority of women don't like him. And he's just given the shits to the ethnic Chinese vote in crucial seats in Sydney and Melbourne. Because he's saying we don't like the Chinese government, but that makes the Chinese voters feel picked upon and, you know, called out. So I think they start way behind. Jackie Lambie says they'll lose Baden and Brass in Tasmania. There's no seats to pick up in South Australia. I reckon they're at risk of at least three, if not more, in Victoria. In West about Australia, Kuyong? there's probably three. What about Kuyong? There's none to pick up in Queensland off the Labor Party who don't have a seat outside of metropolitan Brisbane in Queensland. And in New South Wales, they're just at each other's throats all the time. So I don't see how they can do it, but he's a very good campaigner. And then you've got the Teal Independents. So in Goldstein and in Kuyong, and likewise up in, in Sydney, you've got these very strong, well-organised and very well-resourced independent, almost all women candidates who are absolutely running rings. I mean, they're full of young creative types, social media. I mean, one of the things, I've got to say this, it's a press club. The mainstream media, newspapers, free-to-air television, is borderline irrelevant these days. But they're so self-important, they keep telling you that they're in charge of the message, but they're not. Take a look at, for instance, the feud between Dan Andrews and the Herald Sun, who have campaigned against him from the day he was opposition leader. And Neil Mitchell hasn't made the slightest difference to the standing of the state government. And the tabloids carry on as if they still run this town. They used to, but they don't anymore. But they don't want anyone to know that. I read very broadly and very widely, and I must say the tribalism that's creeping into the media now is it's undemocratic, it's extraordinary. I can't believe how belligerently one-sided 
in particular the Murdoch tabloids, think it's okay to be. It's, it's just extraordinary. And it's part of their own death roll. They're consigning themselves to oblivion by doing it because they're only now preaching to their welded-on choir, which is diminishing. And if they're worried about their re re the reduction in their influence, they've only got themselves to blame. So there you are. There's my take. There you go, Emily. That's for the uh, Melbourne Press Club website. <laughs> that little grab. Um, John, uh, I look forward very much, uh, and thank you to your colleagues at the University of Melbourne for giving us another opportunity via the webinar to hear your thoughts over the next few weeks. We will all be tuning into that. What is the name of the webinar? Um, below the Line. Below the Line? Below the Line. Okay. And we'll all be listening. Yeah. We'll all subscribe. And, and so you go to the Conversation website, and it's there as their first podcast. I imagine through Apple iTunes and all of those different podcasts. Yeah, you can do that yeah. too. But after, I think after two episodes, we're in the top 20 Australian political podcasts, and now we've done four oh, episodes. Oh, you so haven't lost your touch, John. We're going, we're going up the charts. Um, but it's not nearly as good as Apollo and Thelma, A True Tall Tale, published by Hardy Grant and in all good bookshops now. I was just about to do the plug, but you've just done it. Can I put in a plug also, please, for, for bookshops, everyone? Um, I ha they, as you know, they, have, they play a very big part of my life and it is, they are an endangered species. We have a wonderful um, gang here in Melbourne, strong, thriving, um, smaller um, uh, bookshop culture and of course Mary Martin Books are here with us today and if you haven't visited their beautiful bookshop down in South Bank a little further along, please do. Thank you team for coming along to sell the books today. Everybody's now going to buy 10 copies each, okay, so are you ready? And John of course is happy to sign as I said. Thank you Cathy and Melbourne Press Club. Thank, Thank you all. Anne and everybody at Crown. Thank you all. Thank you to all the wonderful sponsors, Melbourne University, law firms, everybody else, the book clubbers and um, can we just say thank you again to our guest, John Fane.